Hello, I'm Randy Tenney. I represent uh, the Airspace Corporation, and today I'm going to be talking about Sparta techniques and how easy they are. If I can get my slide deck working. There we go. Uh, so a little bit about me. I first got into this industry uh, back in 2018. I was hired on as a contractor at NASA's Independent Verification and Validation Center. Uh, in 2022, I was hired on at the Airspace Corporation, kind of as a jack of all trades, let's say. I do a little bit of everything, the exploit developer, vulnerability researcher, a website developer because I am the main developer for the space attack uh, research and tactic analysis framework, also known as Sparta. Um, and then finally, my last kind of name to fame is last year, uh, I was part of the team that won the Red Alert ICS CTF where we got a black badge. So that's pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, so let's kind of back up and talk about Sparta. Uh, in case anybody didn't know about Sparta, Sparta is a cybersecurity framework that we launched back in October of 2022. Uh, we're actually coming up on our second year anniversary, and it is a cybersecurity matrix that mainly focuses on spacecraft and space-related systems. It's very similar to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, where it uh, looks at all of the uh, threats, tactics, techniques, and procedures, only this one focuses on the space systems while MITRE ATT&CK focuses on more on the ground side of things. And really we built this tool for both the commercial and the government users to mainly stay up to date for the various attacks that may threaten their field. And it's really gotten a lot of attention from the, uh, the, the industry itself. We've had a lot of good feedback and it's really grown thanks to the contributions that everybody's done. Um, unfortunately, because everything is kind of unclassified, a lot of the, let's say, attacks that we've talked about are more from a tabletop perspective. Uh, we can't really give any kind of actual attacks that have occurred. Nobody wants to reveal that information. And so a lot of people that are just getting into this industry don't know what they look like. They don't know where they can be detected. They don't know how to really block them. And so that's another reason why like I am, I did the research that I did in order to actually do these attacks in a simulated environment to help people see where things are going to be detected and how they actually look like. To do this though, I need to kind of take a step back and really look at what uh, the, how, how a spacecraft, how we can communicate with it. And so I'm a simple, very, a very simple person. <laughs> so I designed this very simple uh, image. And really the idea is, you know, you have a person behind a computer, we call that command and control server, and they're pressing buttons, sending commands up to the spacecraft. Uh, that command will then flow over to the front end processor, which then travels to a modem. Now, sometimes, not always, uh, a mission or a operation will have a encryptor or authenticator. We call that the bulk crypto unit. Usually it's placed between the front end processor and your modem. So right before those packets are transferred to the RF signal. Uh, this is not always the case. We are encouraging that more often, but still it's a, it's a slow thing to be included. Uh, but anyways, after it either goes through the bulk crypto unit or it doesn't exist, it goes to the modem, gets transferred to the RF signal, to the ground uh, satellite, up to the spacecraft, and there we go. Uh, same with tele uh, telemetry, it just comes back the in the reverse direction. And then of course I added this little feature where you can see where it goes from human readable to spacecraft communication to the RF signal. So. Knowing this and seeing this very simplified manner, I immediately thought about where could the best method of attack be for this system? Um, because a lot of the people in the space industry think that their systems are untouchable just because they're in space. They're, you know, high above Earth, hard to talk to, radio frequency is hard to decode. Um, so in my mind, the most logical attack vector was to the left of that bulk crypto unit or the modem if it doesn't exist and really focusing on either the person itself, uh, the command and control server or the front end processor or any combination of the between. So the idea is you're going to be actually compromising that ground station in some way and attacking at that point. 
Uh, now, unfortunately, because I've been on a lot of missions uh, as a cyber assessor, I've heard a lot of excuses of why this won't work. Actually, people do not like it whenever you say that their mission operations center could be compromised. They think because they have a lot of, you know, guns that guard with guard or guards with guns, uh, you know, different fences with barbed wires that they're untouchable. In fact, they really don't even like acknowledging that there could be a breach in their system and they come up with a ton of different excuses. Uh, some of my favorites are, uh, you know, we got a lot of firewalls. They're not going to get past that, obviously. Everybody knows that's the case. Uh, we're air gapped. Our systems don't even touch the network at all. Okay. Uh, and then they also say that we just accept that in risk of insider threat. You know, the guy behind the command and control server, he may send a bad command, but we've got mitigations. Not always the case. And we, we show them that. Uh, unfortunately, just it's a lot easier to assume that at any point in time, you're, you're going to get you're going to have a breach. You're going to be attacked in some manner. It doesn't matter how. There's always going to be a vulnerability available. So if you assume that that is a possibility, you'll be more likely to patch it. We definitely promote defense in depth, and that's where this comes from. So whenever I say that uh, we are assuming that our initial access vector is the compromised ground system, I am referring to the actual Sparta TTP that we've created of the compromised ground system. And this is one of the ones that has the highest notional risk score as well. So we definitely take this very seriously. And we are saying like, this is going to happen. So just assume it, accept it and be done. Um, and like I said uh, earlier, I'm a very simple person. So my attack that I did was very simple. In fact, it's so simple that I just did a man in the middle to prove that all of these attacks can be done. Uh, specifically, I do an ARP spoof uh, between the command and control server and the front end processor. Now, once again, I kind of feel what you all are seeing are saying. Uh, no, nobody's going to do an ARP spoof on a very complex system. This is too hard. That that's script kitty stuff. Well, uh, a couple of weeks back, we were actually at a training uh, event where we were testing some things, and we did these attacks, and they couldn't detect us because they also thought they were too simple. So. Even in these complex systems, please don't overlook the simple stuff like script kitties exist and they will try to attack you at all times. So that's what I'm saying. And that's what I've done for this entire presentation. So I created a tool that was a, just a very simple man in the middle. Uh, the, I called it the Sparta Cyber Exploiter just because, you know, I liked acronyms. Uh, I'm not here to promote the tool because I will tell you the tool itself is a Python Flask server running Scappy and the NetFilter Q. So you too can create your own Space Invader if you wish. Very simple. You just have to know what those three things are and some CCSDS decoding. Um, so let's talk about the actual environment because these are the attacks. You can read what the attacks we're going to do later. But the actual environment we're going to be attacking is NASA's open source NOS Cubed. You can go to GitHub. I've included the link here. It's a very, very awesome tool if you want to play with a realistic spacecraft system. And you're going to see how realistic it is in these demos. All right, so let's go actually start talking about some TTPs. Uh, the very first one is just exfiltrating telemetry and command. Uh, this one really is kind of overlooked because once again, it's just packets. Nobody knows what to do with them. Actually, this is kind of pretty serious. You're going to see why in a little bit. Um, everything that you see here will actually be used in future attacks. Uh, I will not force you to decode CCSDS. Just know that if it starts with a zero, it's a telemetry. If it starts with a one, it's a command. OK, very simple. Uh, and this is all done just because we're man in the middle, not doing anything special, just printing out those packets to the screen. So the second attack that we're going to do is actually falsifying the telemetry that's downlinked. Uh, in a mission operations center, the telemetry is probably the most important information that a person can get because that tells them the health and status of their spacecraft. So what we're going to do is we're going to de degrade that confidence and we're going to do that by manipulating packets. So I have a video here where we've captured a telemetry packet and we're actually going to change every telemetry that has a specific API ID or application ID so that um, the ground station is going to see what we want them to see and they're just going to start communicating. So here I'm sending a bunch of no-op commands to a camera. No-op stands for no operation. And really that's just going to send the command counter up. But since we're falsifying telemetry, they don't see that information at all. 
Uh, so they are probably thinking, oh, we've lost complete control of our spacecraft or our flight application isn't working. Uh, however, after we stop the command, you will see that command counter go, go up by like, you know, a lot since I sent a bunch of commands. Um, so yeah, that's an immediate degrade of uh, confidence level in your ground system, which is, I don't know, kind of terrifying in my mind. Um, the next one is very similar. We're modifying the packets on the fly. So in this example, we're taking a very specific or we're watching for a very specific uh, command and we're changing it to something else. In this example, we're going to be modifying the camera no-op just to the executive services no-op, just to show and demonstrate what this does. Uh, but this can actually be pretty dangerous. Uh, you know, let's say you captured a command that was changing a registry key on the system and you sent that off and you wanted to block the ground station from, you know, changing it back. This is a specific way in which to do that, where it's going to block every attempt to change it with very little effort on your part. Yeah, so we just send in those commands just to show that they sent and then we come back. Uh, the next one is super easy. It's jamming. Your man in the middle just block the packets. Uh, once again, this stops the de this degrades the confidence in your uh, downlinked telemetry and it can also stop any commands from going up. So once again, if you've attacked the spacecraft in any way, you can just stop them from communicating entirely. Um, in this case, all you need to know is the uh, whatever port and IP you wanted to block. In this case, we're blocking the uh, command and control server and the telemetry downlink. And yeah, telemetry is not going. And then whenever we stop it, uh, it's going back. So once again, it's, it's a very simplistic attack, but it's detrimental to the mission operation center. Um, and the other way uh, on the other spectrum of that is flooding attack. Uh, flooding, you're just sending a bunch of information to whatever port you want. In this case, and just for a visual effect, I send it to the telemetry just so you can see what information's there. Um, there's actually two different flooding attacks that we follow in Sparta. One is the valid commands and the other one's just random data. I'm gonna be showing the random data one just to show like how you can degrade confidence in that uh, ground station again. Um, and as you can see, it's just complete chaos on the ground station itself. Um, th the idea of this though, is that you want to basically block all communications. Uh, you could also send a bunch of random data up to the satellite. The only reason I didn't do that here is because due to the simulation, it has to be pretty beefy, uh, thanks to the 42 uh, simulator, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, so really, it didn't show any kind of good visual effects. Um, but yeah, you could totally do that. And if you send it up to the bird, you could do everything from locking it up or crashing it, really. Oh, skip too far ahead. All right, so this is the, my probably one of my favorite ones that we're going to do. It's the rogue ground station. You do not have to be man in the middle for this. In fact, this one's probably even more dangerous. It's another initial access vector uh, which a ver with a very high uh, notional risk score. The only thing you really need to know is what IP and port the front end processor is talking on. Uh, a lot of front end processors that I've looked at does not have any kind of authentication enabled to talk to that port. So you can send whatever data you want. Um, I'm just doing it in this tool just to sh because I like everything, once again, simple, together, in a nice GUI for visual effect. That's the only reason it's here. Now for the rogue ground station, you actually need to have the command and control server or command and control database, or you need to be having captured packets like in the man in the middle. Uh, in this case, as a good hacker, I have had the command and control database and I'm going to upload that to my system. Uh, Command and control database is probably crown jewels of your, you know, operation. If some for some reason it gets leaked or it, it's, you know, captured, uh, yeah, your system's done if they can figure out how to decode it. In this case, I upload it. I know how to do everything. Uh, I send it to that front end processor and I just send it a bunch of commands just to make sure that it works. In this case, just no ops, you know, not really caring just to see, just to show that I have access to it. But I thought it would be really cool if we combine some attacks. So I'm going to work with the reaction wheel. Now, uh, the reaction wheel on a spacecraft is how it turns in space to point to where it needs to go. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun if we, you know, activated one. 
Uh, but I'm actually going to combine this with an attack previously where we were changing the telemetry down. So I captured a telemetry packet that we had and I go back to my changing packet uh, attack. I'm just going to change it to whatever that is. So, you know, the ground operations doesn't know that I'm doing anything. Launch that attack, go back to my road ground station. Um, I really don't care, you know, what wheel I use. Oh, so this is the 42 server, by the way. This is what makes it so beefy. This CubeSat will actually rotate around Earth and spin, which is really nice. And that's another reason why this NOS Cube simulator is pretty awesome. Um, it'll spin with every tick, so you'll actually see it. So yeah, with the reaction wheel, I don't care. I'm just going to set the torque to 10 and let it fly. So every tick uh, in the 42 server, it actually, you know, flops along. So eventually you'll start seeing that CubeSat rotate on that wheel as it's been activated. And of course the ground operators, they're not aware. I'm completely blocking them. They have no clue. Uh, and yeah, so they think everything's fine and dandy. Pretty awesome. Now they would see it if I went back into my, uh, you know, my ground station and I stopped that attack, which I'll go ahead and do just to show you what uh, that would look like. Um, and if you look over on the uh, Cosmos packet, you actually see that uh, wheel zero start to change. And that's how you're going to see that the reaction wheel is changing. But once again, they had not a single clue. Man in the middle. Who would have known it's that powerful? So for my last attack, and this is the one that, you know, I, I had a lot of help with this. Uh, I did not write this rogue flight application. It was actually written by some of my friends at the IVM feed facility, uh, specifically the JSTAR team. Uh, and they wrote this uh, rogue flight application that they called Havoc, which is a backdoor into CFS. I just kind of modified a little bit to fit our needs, but this is uh, pretty dangerous. This assumes that the initial access vector was the supply chain risk. And in this idea, uh, because supply chain risk, our flight application is uploaded, the ground operation is not aware, and because we can talk to the front end processor, we can then talk to our flight app. Uh, specifically, this flight app does three things. It can upload a file, download a file, and basically give us full command access to the satellite. Because a lot of satellites right now are, are running on a Linux system, so we have full Linux terminal with this. Um, so yeah. Let me show you. So once again, all I have to do is just point it at the uh, front end processor, IP and port, and uh, just select which command I want. I sent a quick no op just to make sure it's working, um, but really I'm more interested in uploading a file. Uh, as a good hacker, I was trying to think of a way to take over the satellite and make sure it was mine and nobody else can touch it. So I created a ransomware script, uh, you know, because why not? I thought that'd be fun. Uh, so we send that up. I wanted to be low and slow so that nobody could really detect me. So it takes a good couple of minutes. Um, but it's it's a pretty fun uh, idea to think that you're going to ransomware a satellite, right? Because then you only are, you're the only ones that go and attack it. I'm going to get Buku money and, you know, whatever mission is just, you know, SOL. Uh, so yeah, I uploaded the satellite and now I'm going to run my command literally like I was on a Linux terminal. So make sure it can execute and encrypt the system. Now, the fun thing with CFS and the reason why this works is all of their flight applications are actually in their own individual startup scripts. So I can encrypt everything except for the command ingestion, the base CFS, the, you know, the bus, and of course my own application because I want to be able to talk to myself. Um, and once that's encrypted, I just do a hardware reboot because I have the command and telemetry database because who doesn't need a good reboot after a while? And then we just wait for it to come back up. Now, I will tell you that this takes a long time to come up, so I'm just going to talk about Havoc and how awesome it is because with this tool, and I'm really excited to continue researching on this, we can do so much more. I can actually start doing way more Sparta TTPs with this one tool than I could with the actual man in the middle road ground station because I'm gonna have access to the actual bus, so we can do replay, bus replay attacks. We'll be able to do you know, GPS spoofing, attack the hardware. There's all kinds of things we can do. Um, so while we're, it's getting ready, I was just opening up some command centers so you can see that they have no access because I really wanna prove that point of how like in the dark they are. Because there is no, especially in this system, there's no way to run a script like I just did. So literally I am the only one that's able to do anything. They can't even upload a file. 
So they're they're really, you know, not doing good. Yeah, so telemetry's down. They're not even getting any telemetry back. They're not send, sending any commands. Nothing's happening. I've already sent my ransom. You know, I want to get paid a lot of money for whatever system this is. And if I was a good hacker, of course, I'm going to go decrypt it, you know, make sure they get their stuff back. I don't want to keep that running. And that's what I'm just doing here. I'm just going to send a quick decrypt command because I'm not going to encrypt my own script and make sure it's decrypted, do another reboot of the system and then wait for it to come back up and then they'll have full access again. So if you ever wanted to know how to ransomware a uh, satellite, there you go. All right, so while this is running, if th that's, that was the end of my attacks, and if any of these kind of gave you like heartburn, made you worry, you know, like, oh my God, what's happening? Why are this so simple? Why is she able to do this with nothing but an ARP spoof? Uh, luckily, every single attack I did is described in Sparta. And with those descriptions, we've actually included countermeasures. So these countermeasures will tell you exactly how to, you know, how to block it. It'll tell you all of the different uh, NIST controls that you can add. If you're an ISO 27001 uh, person, those are in there too. We've tried to map it to every single thing that people that we know in the industry use. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend going and looking and reading on that and just making sure that you are, you know, you have those controls enabled. All right, so in summary, uh, defense in depth is very important. There are a lot of different ways that these attacks could be blocked, but you know, really we wouldn't have realized that until I did this research. Uh, for example, the best way that these attacks could have been blocked, which I mentioned here, is either including in the bulk crypto unit way earlier on in the system, uh, which you know I would not have been able to communicate with my rogue app. The rogue uh, ground station wouldn't have worked without the uh, uh, encryption keys. So that would have definitely blocked a vast majority of this information or the, these attacks. Um, and I also include the uh, space data link security. If you do use CCSDS, it's another protocol that they've released uh, to include both authentication and encryption to their packets. So once again, it's very simple things that you can add just to block these kind of attacks. Um, I've also included in this PowerPoint some reading material because I know you guys like to read and you want more things to read. So a lot of these briefs are on Sparta, like how we thought of the idea. Uh, we've also included a lot of links to Sparta, like how to get started with it, where to get started with it, because it's a huge application. Um, and there's a lot of different uh, media examples of other talks that have been done on this kind of sort of same topic. Um, I've also included these more DEF CON talks that uh, my uh, colleague Brandon Bailey have done, uh, also including some of the SISAT work he's done, and a lot of different papers and articles that uh, also talk about different attack vectors and uh, countermeasures that you can include. And that's it. So, thank you very much. Good. I can't see anything. All right. I can't see that light is blonde. Are there any questions? Yeah. I can't see if they have any questions, so. Anybody have any questions? So with this is just assuming CFS, which CFS, if you're not aware, is NASA's open source satellite uh, kind of information. So you can actually go to their GitHub, download CFS and build your own spacecraft. Um, so CFS has this methodology in which, like I said, it uploads or it starts uh, all of its flight applications through those uh, .so files. So if you know, say I wanted to do a supply chain attack, I would just find that development server and just put my SO file in there, or if they had like uh, upload file protocol like CFDP, uh, then I would be able to upload my own startup script and just do another reboot. Uh, so there's a lot of different methods in which I could get that flight application onto the actual system. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys.